if you would have known me as a young boy, you would have said, wow, what a timid and cautious little boy he is. I was very, very timid and cautious. Part of it is just simply the way that I'm wired. I'm just, I'm wired to be cautious. But also part of it is because I grew up on a, on a farm and ranch. And if you know anything about farmers and ranchers, you likely know, uh, you likely know many of them who are missing fingers and, and, and arms and even legs because especially those who are not cautious. Uh, farming is a very, very dangerous um, career path. And, and I'm proud to say that of my parents and of my five siblings, all of us have our hands and fingers and all of our, all of our limbs because, because we, were, we were taught to be cautious on the farm. And, and I, I, again, at 12 years old, at 12 years old, I started driving the tractor. And the tractor that I drove was a Case 1070. Now, it's, it's, a, it's about a 100-horsepower tractor. It doesn't seem very big, but for a 12-year-old boy, and, by the way, it was the only new tractor, the only new tractor my parents have ever bought in their entire lives. It wasn't a very big tractor. It, we we, we uh, drug an eight-foot chisel behind it. It was, it was a small plow. But for a 12-year-old boy, I knew one thing, and that was to not mess up the tractor. <laughs> and so I was very cautious growing up. Very cautious. And I, and I took that, that timidity and, and maybe even that shyness and that safety, not just in life, but also in my spiritual life as well. When I was a sophomore in high school, the youth group that I was a part of in my small church, they went on a mission trip. There were about 10 of us in that youth group, and there was one in the youth group that refused to go on the mission trip because he didn't want to do anything out of a safety zone. <laughs> that was me. I didn't, I didn't want to... I, I didn't want to do anything that was out of my safety zone. And so it, that's why it came as such a shock just a couple of years later, whenever God called me to be a pastor. That was so out of the realm of possibility in my life. I was going to follow the footsteps of my dad, but somehow, miraculously, God had called this timid, shy, very safe young man to be a pastor. And it went against every, it went against every everything in my being. It would have been so much easier had Jesus not said this. It would have been so much easier had Jesus not said, lose your life for my sake. For when you lose your life for my sake, then you will find it. If you try to save your life, you're going to lose your life. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me daily. We wish that Jesus simply would have said, if it feels good, do it. We, we wish Jesus would have said, you, you do you. Just, just, just do you. But instead, he said, take up your cross. Deny yourself. Lose your life for my sake. Don't save your life, because in saving your life, you're, gonna, you're really going to lose your life. You know, oftentimes we don't we don't want we want to simply ignore what Jesus what Jesus said. We we want to have a very safe and cautious faith. We want to have a safe religion. We have someone to forgive. Well, we don't really want to get involved with that. We don't want to make amends to the one who has wronged us. We don't want to get too involved in church. We're hesitant to pray. We don't want to go to we don't want to be involved in Sunday school or a small group or a Bible study. We don't want to come back to church after COVID. We'll just stay at home and, and watch on television. We keep God at, at an arm's length. We don't want to get too serious about faith. Most of us just simply want advice from Jesus. It's as if Jesus is our interior decorator. We just, we just take advice, and sometimes he'll give us advice, but we often ignore it. Jesus, what should, what should, I, what should I put over here on this wall? Well, I think maybe a beautiful picture of a flower. Oh, no, I don't want a flower. How about, how about I put a, a beautiful landscape scene over here with a seating area? Thanks for your help, Jesus. <laughs> That's how we treat him. As if he just simply gives us a little bit of advice. We ignore his advice, but, we, but he gives it to us anyway. And then we, we thank him and we go on our way. 
We want, a, we want advice. We want a consultant. We want a savior. Someone who can do something for us. We don't particularly want a Lord. Someone who demands something from us. A savior, no doubt. Jesus is our savior. He has done something for us, but he also demands that he is our Lord and he demands something from us. Today, we're, we're continuing this series examining uh, these sayings of Jesus that it would, just be, it would just be so much easier had Jesus never said these things. Things like love your enemies. That w- it would, our lives would be so much easier had Jesus not said love your enemies because we know how to hate our enemies. It comes quite natural to us, but Jesus said love our enemies. We know what it's like to lust in our heart. We heard his saying last week, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who has lusted after another person has committed adultery in their life. And we saw that anything that causes us to sin must be surgically removed from our lives. Must be cut out, excised from our lives. It it would be much easier, again, had Jesus simply said, you do you. But instead, he said, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Lose your life for my sake. Even Jesus' disciples faced the temptation of an easy gospel. A gospel that required nothing from them. That's what they wanted. That's what they had. They thought that that's what they got with Jesus. They had been following him for almost three years at this time. They had received so much from Jesus. They had received healing, they had received food, they had, they had seen incredible, in, incredibly miraculous things had gone on in Jesus' ministry, and, and they thought that that was just simply what was going to happen. And so if you back up just a bit in chapter 16, Jesus asked them, so who do people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some say that you are Elijah come back from the dead. Others have said that you are John the Baptist. Others have said you're a great prophet. And Jesus looked at them and said, who do you say that I am? And it was Simon, Simon Peter. Simon said, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The very first time in Jesus' life that someone had professed him as Christ, as Savior, as Lord, the Son of God come incarnate. And Jesus looked at Simon and said, today, today you have a new name. Your name today is Rock Peter, for upon this rock I will build my house. And then immediately he goes in and begins to teach them about what's going to happen to him. He tells them, that he is going to suffer, and he is going to, he's going to die, and he's going to be resurrected. They didn't want to hear that. They, they wanted to hear only what Jesus could do for them. They wanted to hear about the miracles. They wanted to hear all about how he could save them, not how he was going to be their Lord. So Jesus told them how, again, how he was going to, how he was going to be killed and on the third, be, third day be raised. And Peter took him aside. The same Peter who had just proclaimed him as Savior and Lord, same Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said, Get behind me, Satan. What, what, what? What's what's going on here? In the one breath, Jesus is calling him the rock upon which the church will be built. And on on the the very next breath, he's calling him Satan. What is happening? Peter wants an easy gospel. Peter wants a savior, but not a Lord. Wants a savior, but not a Lord. so Jesus then begins to teach them what it's going to be like to follow him. For I tell you, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The disciples, they would have known what it was like to take up their cross. Now, this sounds trite anymore because it's been so overused. Oh, it's just the cross I got to bear. You know, if someone 
at the, at the stoplight in front of us doesn't go, doesn't go when it turns green. Oh, it's the burden I've got to bear. It's the cross I've got to bear. Our shoestring breaks. Oh, it's the cross I've got to bear. That's not the kind of cross that Jesus is calling us to bear. And his disciples knew it. They had seen, they had seen dozens, if not hundreds, march to their death, literally carrying their own cross. There was no doubt in their mind what Jesus was saying when he said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. There was no doubt in their mind what that meant. It meant that they had to die. They had to die to themselves. Ten of his twelve disciples actually did die for their faith. It's very likely, very likely that most of us, if, if I mean probably none of us, will actually have to, have to, have to face the face execution for our faith we can we can envision however we can likely all envision making the final great stand for christ facing the guillotine or the of the executioner or or boldly going to prison we can all probably imagine that in our mind but very likely that's not what's going to happen really what faith is called faith calls from us not one final decision but instead it's a series of daily decisions it's not, it's not that final facing the executioner or, or facing imprisonment for our faith. It is a daily walking with Jesus Christ. It is a daily taking up our cross. It is a daily dying to ourselves. And only when we die to ourselves, only when we deny ourselves, then will we find real life, true life, abundant life. But if we try to hold on to our lives, if we try to just do you, just you do you. If it feels good, do it. That's when we'll lose our lives. It's only when we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, follow him. It's only when we lose our lives and die to ourselves that we are then resurrected. You see, it takes death to be resurrected, and that's what faith is all about. It's dying to ourselves, dying to the old self, and being raised in a new life. That's what this sacred meal is about that we're about to partake in. Dying to ourselves and experiencing the resurrected Jesus Christ. In fact, in Allowing that resurrected Christ to become part of us. To live out that life of serving others. To live out that life of denying ourselves, dying to ourselves, and being resurrected. Would you bow with me, please? Oh Lord, we thank you for the incredible opportunity to serve you. Instead of simply serving our whims and wishes, the incredible opportunity, the incredible call to die to ourselves, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow you. And in doing so, O oh Lord, we will find life, life in the full, life abundant. Oh God, help us to die that we might live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.